You're not living with Jesus, trust me, you're not going to die for him. I have never seen a man die for a cause he didn't live. It is a spiritual violence because we're not fighting against it. You can't use the physical to fight the spiritual. My dear friends, praise God, we have some people this morning who have made up their mind that heaven will be taken by storm. They plan to be transplanted from the kingdom of darkness this morning. Oh, into the kingdom of grace. And then into the kingdom of glory. You have loved us so much, oh dear Father, tongue cannot tell. Yes, Lord. And you want to save each and every one of us. Yes, Lord. And you are still calling men and women to surrender their lives to you so that they can have a place in your eternal kingdom. Yes, Lord. I pray that at this moment, dear Father, you will cover your people, those who have made the decision to follow you into the watery grave of baptism. Yes, Lord. I pray, dear Father, that your Holy Spirit will take full control of them. Yes, Lord. Holy angels will protect them. Yes, Lord. Lord, wherever they have problem, we ask that you will bring deliverance, yes, Lord. that you will bring sustenance, yes, dear Father, so that they will never be the same again that you will work through their life each and every day so that they may have the assurance that you are always with them. Bless them continually now, dear Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. People who come to this church, don't come for any job. Right now, you know, giving some cloud here. People who come here are sinners. They're not living for Don't let this train pass you by. Happy Sabbath, everyone. And a pleasant Sabbath to you all. And I want to say a special welcome to the Frasers. Amen. I do want to thank you for worshiping with us this Sabbath. We go way back. I pray that God's blessings will continue to be upon you. And all those who came in a little bit late, we want to extend a special welcome to you. And all those who are viewing us via live stream. We're going to pray now as we get right into this morning's message. Please pray with me. Loving Father in heaven. As we are about to look into the deep things of God, we're asking a special anointing upon this morning's message, O oh Lord. We pray that it will resonate in our lives and produce fruits of righteousness. We ask that you will bind all distractions now, Lord. May our hearts and our minds be focused on Jesus. We pray that you will be with us as we look into your word again, that our hearts will be impressed. May we be drawn closer to Jesus, is our prayer in his precious name. Amen. Do we all have a lesson? You all, everyone needs a lesson. If you don't have a lesson, please raise your hand. If you didn't get a lesson, please raise your hand. We are continuing our study in the book, The Pilgrim's Progress. It was written by John Bunyan. We have been told through the spirit of prophecy that there are two things you will get when you seek to read this book. It says the book, The Pilgrim's Progress, it portrays the Christian's life so accurately. And it presents the love of Christ so attractively. Through its instrumentalities, hundreds and thousands have been converted. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't gotten a copy of the book, The Pilgrim's Progress, you need to get a copy. Get a hardback copy. And you need to read it for yourself. 
We're now on lesson number 22. The two chained. The two lions chained. Well, last we left, we left two unfortunate characters. Mistrust and Timorous. They were heading the wrong way. They were headed back to the city of destruction because they saw a lion. Two lions. Whether sleeping or waking, they had no idea. Now we're going to begin reading now as Christian makes his way. And I read. Now also he remembered the story. He remembered the story that Mistress and Timorous told him of how they were frightened with the sight of the who? Lions. Then said Christian to himself again, These beasts range in the night for their prey, and if they should meet with me in the dark, how should I shift them? How should I escape being by them torn in pieces? Thus he went on. But while he was thus bewailing his unhappy miscarriage, he lift up his eyes and beheld there was a very stately place before him, the name of which was, and that's our next study, beautiful. And it stood just by the highway side. Bunyan said, I, now I saw in my dreams that he made haste and went forward, that if possible he might get lodged there. Now before he had gone far, he, he entered into a very narrow passage, which was about a furlong, and that's biblical, a furlong. That's the new city, a furlong of the porter's lodge. And looking very narrowly before him as he went, he spied how many lions? Underscore not one or three or four, but he spied two lions in the way. Now he said, I see the danger that Mistress and Timorous were driven back by. Bunyan says now, the lions were chained, but he saw not the, he saw not the chains. Then he was afraid and thought also himself to go back after then, for he thought nothing but death was before him, but the potter, but the potter at the lodge, whose name is Watchful. And we have a whole study on Watchful. Perceiving that Christian made a halt as if he would go back, cried unto him, saying, is thy strength so small? Here's that word now. Fear not the lions, for they are chained. And the place there, a place here for a trial of faith, where it is for the discover, discovery of those that have none, keep in the midst of the path, and no hurt shall come unto thee. Beloved, this is an allegory. We've got to get beneath the surface. We need to see what Bunyan is really trying to say to us the last Sabbath in 2015. Let's look at the interpretation. We'll begin by posing a question. Let's take our hands out now. Question number one. How many lions did Christian see and why? Now, Philip, he saw two lions. Philip, he saw two, two, two lions. And the question is now why? Now, in Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 9, now the texts are on the screen to help us move swiftly. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4 and 9, two are what? Better than one. Because they have what? They have a good reward for their labor. That is why Bunyan put two lions, two are better than one. Fill it in now. He saw two because in unity there is strength. And the devil knows this. Heaven knows this. My dear friends, that's why we have been admonished. We should all speak the same thing. Let there be no divisions and schisms amongst us. Satan realized if he's going to be successful in overthrowing the Christian, there has to have unity. We are told that angels, demons don't even like each other. But they put away their differences and they unite to take us down. There is unity. There is unity in, and, 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 and strength. That's why he saw two lions. Are you with me? Now I'm heading somewhere this morning. You just stick with me. Question number two now. Where were the two lions stationed and why? Fill it in now. They were stationed, they were placed at the entrance, underscore entrance, of the place called 
beautiful. Now that is a whole lecture and the place called beautiful is God's visible church on earth. And we have a whole lecture on God's true church. If Christ was here today, which church would he attend? Well, the one that's keeping all the commandments. That much I do know. That much I do know. Why now? Uh, to, to frighten and scare the pilgrims from entering that place and accepting the truths on the score of that day. That's why they were placed there at the entrance. To scare you from entering and accepting the truths of that day. Now, beloved, believe it, the lion is the most mentioned creature in the entire Bible. I looked it up. I actually counted it. It is the most mentioned creature in the entire Bible. I do not know why. And all through the Bible, we've seen patriarchs and prophets, they have their encounters with lion. Uh, take, for instance, Samson. He met a lion. Find that in, jot it down, Judges 14, verse 5. Daniel had an encounter with a lion. He was thrown in the lion's den in Daniel chapter 6. And when you look at the prophetic symbols, the prophetic visions given to Daniel and John, Daniel 7, one of those beasts was a lion. Revelation 13, that beast has the mouth of a lion. Lion is the most mentioned creature in the entire Bible. Now, Question now, what are some things a lion is likened to in the Bible? Now, this may seem very elementary, but I'm trying to make a point, can't you see? A lion can symbolize Jesus Christ. Fill it in, please. You'll find that reference in Revelation chapter 5 and verse number 5. And the Bible says, this is I quote, and one of the elders, and that, is, that word is masculine. Sorry, can't get away with it. It connotes masculinity. Not femininity. You can read between the lines. Weep not. Behold, the who? The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. The lion can represent Jesus Christ. And by the way, this phrase is only mentioned one time in the entire Bible. And the Rastafarians have the audacity. To apply this phraseology to Haley Selassie. That is sacrilegious. And it must be rejected and denounced. It is begotten from the pit. Lion can symbolize Jesus Christ. Lion can also symbolize Satan. You ought to know that. You'll find this reference in 1 Peter uh, chapter 5 and verse number 8. And the Bible says... And I read, be sober and be vigilant. That's watchful. Because your adversary, the devil, is as a who? Roaring lion that walks about seeking whom he can devour. No, may devour. May symbolize permission. May I have your car? No. I can't have it. He's seeking who he may devour. He has to get permission. Symbolize two lions, and these two lions are at war. You know, Mark Anthony. I'm not talking about the one who married um, Jill, Jennifer Lopez either. The one who was obsessed with Cleopatra. She was beautiful. Mark Anthony was obsessed with lions. And the record said he would yoke two lions to his chariots. And they would take him everywhere he would go. My dear friends, I want to tell you that there are two lions no man can yoke together. One is the conquering lion, Jesus Christ, and the other is Satan. You can't yoke these two lions together because they're at war. You know, you can hold two opinions in politics. I was in a bank the other day, man, and I had to cash a check, lest it was robbery. And I had one thing on my mind, my money on my mind, a man on my money. And there was a fellow beside me, he wanted to start a conversation. And I was in severe pain. You know, when I went to England, I was in an accident, man. And my neck was hurting me. And I was trying to get in and out. And he wanted to spark conversation. And he began to talk about politics. And I was listening, and he sounded like a Democrat. But then he told the man he was a Republican. 
I'm here to tell you, you may hold two views in politics, but you'll be hated. You'll be tabooed. You'll be despised. You may hold two concepts in science, but you can't hold two opinions in religious things. No, truth can't be lie. And lie cannot be truth. And that which is crooked, you can't make straight. And that which is straight, don't even try to make crooked. And there are those amongst us who are trying to merge these two lines together. It will not work. Just like oil and water can't mix. And to bring a fusion of the two, you'll bring confusion in your life. Therefore, my challenge is, is a wise one. If God be God, serve him. And if you plan to serve the devil, well, do the deed deliberately. Don't fool around and make a sport at it. Take spirits and whatever you're going to be, be transparent. And be real. I met a friend the other day. I haven't seen him in years, man. I went to the park. When I saw him, he had a big old spliff in his hand. He didn't try to hide it. And I saw him smoke that thing. And I said, man, what are you going to quit smoking ganja? And he said, man, only Ja alone can help me. And he was true. Because he can't help himself. <laughs> only God alone could deliver that man. He was real. He was transparent. Can't yoke these two lines together. And we are told they do nothing in partnership together. They don't say, let's put over our differences for the good of humanity. They're not yoked together in no ecumenical movement either. One you may have, but not both. The lion can symbolize the wicked. Jot it down, please. And also symbolize the righteous, the prince of in, princes of Israel. I must admit, Bunyan threw me for a loop with this lion thing. Because I had no idea where he was going. Where he was going. And I awoke one morning, I hit me like a light bulb. And I saw the allegorism. And I wrote a question. It shed light on it. Question four says, why did Bunyan use lions? And whom did these lions represent in his day? And I didn't know who. And it dawned on me, bam, England. Yeah. This is where you see the brilliancy of Bunyan now. You know, uh, creatures are used to denote Countries. Jamaica, we have the doctor bird. Over here, we have the eagle. And Canada, having had the beaver, or bear, whatever, Russia. But you know it. But in Bunyan's day, fill it in now, the lion, the, the lion roaring was too often royal, the royal lion of England. Look where he's coming from now. That's why he put two lions. Bunyan had felt the fear of it. And he described it uh, uh, graphically, his feelings when he was imprisoned. What do you mean? Bunyan's day, those who identified with the true gospel were labeled the sinisters. They were called non-conformists because they would not conform. They stood in opposition to the established church, the Anglican church and the civil laws that upheld its authority in the land. The nonconformists were required to renounce their faith and fall in line with the regimented religious and social norms. Bunyan was later arrested for being a nonconformist and was imprisoned from 1660 to 1672 and again from 67, from 75 rather, to 78 where he wrote The Pilgrim's Progress. What happened now? When the monarchy was restored in 1660, Charles II, and he was the rotten of all the bunch with his weird hairstyle. Began enacting several laws designed to oppress the nonconformists and legalize their persecution. The lions. Note, these laws were known as the Charlotte Code and including the Act of Uniformity in 1662, we're crying church leaders, to, to consent or assent to, the, to reissue the Book of Common Prayer. The Conventional Act in 1664, outlawing church services where the Book of Common Prayers were not used, even homes. And a five-mile act in 1665, outlawing pastors from being, from being ejected from the state, 
church by forbidding them to come within five miles of a city or town where they had ministered. These other, law, other laws caused many to shrink back and forsake the truths in Bunyan's day. And that's why you see now mistrust and timorous. Thus, the two lions filling in now may be taken to represent the civil and the religious tyranny. Two lions that terrified many converts in John Bunyan's day. Thus, multitude turned back like mistrust and timorous, while at the same time, many like Bunyan himself went forward for a time and fell in the lion's mouth. That is where John Bunyan was coming from. Those two lions, not one lion. Two lions. Because they have good for their labor and their reward. Beloved, there have been two lions in every age. These lions are there, these two principles. In the days of Jesus, they were there. Altered in form of same in nature. In John 12, many believed on Jesus Christ. You know that? But the lions were roaring. And the Bible says in Luke, John 12, 42, Nevertheless, the chief rulers and also believed on him. But because of the, because of the Pharisees, they did not confess lest they were put out of the synagogues. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. In every age you find these two powers. Civil and religious powers. It was alive in the Old Testament. Jezebel and Ahab, the odd couple. And she was weird. They had merged together and they cut off the prophets of God. But bless God, there was a nonconformist. His name was Elijah. And Elijah would not conform. Thus he had to be on the run, hiding in caves and mountains. But bless God, he's in heaven today. I wish he was around. I would love to be with Elijah today. Carry his mantle like the prophets of old. Every age, every dispensation, we see these two principles. The two lions. Now what two biblical characters united their powers to persecute Jesus? The two lions. You find in the book of Luke. Luke 23, the Bible says, And Herod, with his men at war, set him at naught, the Bible says, mocked him, Jesus, and arrayed upon him a gorgeous robe and sent him to Pilate. And the Bible says now, at the same day, at the same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends together. For before this, they were at enmity. They couldn't stand being in the same place except for appearances. But the Bible says they put away their differences. They united to persecute and prosecute Jesus Christ. Pilate, therefore, must represent the state. That's one line. Civil. And the church was Herod, and he called himself king of the Jews. There was not a drop of Jewish blood in this man's name. His mother was a Samaritan woman. He was superstitious. He was cunning. He was sly like a fox. Guilty of incest, he took his brother Philip's wife, which was his niece. He was sick. He was a pervert. Two principles. The two lions in every age. And let me tell you something. Herod and Pilate are getting together. Two lions symbolize church and state, my dear friends. We see the principle in Revelation chapter 13. There are two beasts, the, lamp, the, la, the leopard light beasts in the first half of the chapter. It's in your handout. That's Rome. And the last beast is a lamb like beast, which is America. They're coming together. Oh, yes. Note, we have in the United States long enjoyed the blessings of religious freedom. In your handout, the lions have largely been kept out of the way. We have not been, uh, we have not, sorry, we have not had to fear an oppressive government of church and state uh, persecuting, pressuring, and persecuting those who wouldn't conform to its social ideas and religious edicts, but times may be changing. 
You've heard about the Patriot Act. That thing has cut our freedom to shreds. You know, and I'm telling you something. I think as a people, we are still in the dark ages mentally. Because it hasn't clicked in our minds yet. But the world knows something going on, you know. Now and then you find these secular cartoon columnists, they drop a little nugget. They can't put two and two together. When in 2006, one cartoon columnist said the Patriot Act, and he goes back to 1775 where Dred, Cots, Dred Scott's key said, give me liberty, give me death. And then he pictured your ex-president, because I didn't vote for him, said, give up your liberty. We're all going to die. Thanks to the Patriot Act, we the people have been shredded. Our rights are taken away from us. And we don't even realize it, my dear friends. And as a result now, we have seen the fox. Now go out guarding the chicken coop. We are here. We are here. But that's not what I really want to tell you this morning. I don't want to sound doom and gloom, preacher. It's the last Sabbath in the year. We need some hope. Would you say amen? amen. <laughs> but my point I want to say is that there is a limitation of Satan and the powers of evil. Where do you find that? It's in the allegory. Now, I must admit, I never saw this until Bunyan brought it out to me. I have to give him credit. Now, the lions were chained. Where did Bunyan get that from? Question number six now. What was attached to the lion's feet? Bunyan was quoting Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. And now we've oftentimes read this text and we apply it to the millennium, which is true. But ben, Bunyan now threw a spinner, and I have never seen this in all my life. The text now says now. This is where the chain came from. Bunyan says now, Revelation 20 says now, And I, son of the angel, come down from heaven, having a what? Key to the what? And a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. A chain. Now, in this context, we know that this is the millennium. A time where the devil won't have anybody to tempt. Why all the righteous folks are in heaven. All the wicked are dead. The earth will be depopulated of life. No sun. You take away the sun, the earth is chilled with ice. He'll have a thousand years to contemplate. Now that's the primary application. But Bunyan now threw a spinner. And what Bunyan is saying based on this text, and I must admit I've never seen it until I put this together. In a spiritual sense, it teaches that there are restrictions placed on the powers of of evil like a dog on a leash the lion were chained and we see this principle all through the bible you consider these texts in your handout job said it well job 38 verse 11 and the bible says now and hitherto shalt thou come but no further and here shall thy proud waves stay. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days and caused the day spring to know their place? Job is saying that Lucifer can come hither. But you can't go no further. There is a chain placed on him. Restrictions, limitations. The lions are chained. Somebody ought to say amen. Psalms 104, verse 9, David put it pretty well, where he said, Thou hast set a bound, that they, who? The wicked, may not pass over. They may not turn again to cover the earth. The wicked have a restriction placed upon the powers of evil. And I am so thankful for this. This is not in your handout, because I have a whole lot of campaigns lined up for next year. Oh, yes. Not local and international. And Mrs. White said, it's not in your handout now, but jot the reference down. In the book earlier, and she says this now, at the time, at that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be what? Come on the earth. 
the nations will be what? Yet what? Yet held in what? Held in check as not to prevent the work of the third angel's message. Held in check. You can't shut the preacher down and shut the message out. They are held in check. The lions are chained, brothers and sisters. Lions are chained. And then David, oh, I love this one in Psalms 124. When I feel discouraged and overwhelmed, I like to resort to this psalm. David says, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who's on our side, when man rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick when their wrath was kindled against us. He says in verse 4, then the waters had overwhelmed us and the streams had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Verse 6 says, blessed be the Lord who hath not given us a prey to their teeth, he says, our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowler. The snare, the snare is broken and we are escaped. Some of us should have been dead and crippled and paralyzed and mesmerized. God is good. The lions are chained. Our help is in the name of the Lord, he says, who made heaven and earth. Beloved, I'm going to take a, a look into the creation of Lucifer. Not to glorify him this one, but to blow his cover. Now I have, I made a typographical error. I want you to just correct it, please. Uh, under this caption, it should be Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14. Please just draw a line through that subheading, please. It's Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 18. And you just write Ezekiel 28 verses 11 through 19. These two passages of scripture, they give us the context of Lucifer's creation, his rebellion, and his fall. So please jot it down. Isaiah 14, 12 through 18, and Ezekiel 28, verses 11 through 19. Do you have it? Now, I'm going to pose a question now, particularly your brain. Question 7 now says now, after Jesus created Lucifer, and it was Jesus who made Lucifer, based on Colossians chapter 1. All things were made by him. You read that chapter. After Jesus created Lucifer, what mathematical term was attached to him for all these math majors in the place? Now, in Ezekiel 28 verse 12, the answer is found. The Bible says now, son of man. Take up lamentation upon the king of Tyre, which is a metaphor for Lucifer. Say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, underscore sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You know, some of us think that God is impressed by beauty. And it is true, it is said that pretty ladies get off lighter in court than those who are not so pretty. They think the world owes them a living. But my dear friends, we have come to a point today where sin is now served on a platter of beauty. And we think that God is impressed by beauty. If he was, he would have kept Lucifer in heaven because he was beautiful. But he kicked him out because he sinned. So, thou sealest up the sum. That is a mathematical term. What, what that mean is this? What does it mean? Sealest up the sum. Now, if I was to ask you a question this morning, if I say to you, give me the sum of six plus eight, what would you give me? Who said 15? <laughs> That's not the sum. <laughs> the sum is 14. Isn't that right? That's the sum. It can't get no summer than that. <laughs> See, let's up the sum. From this we learn now that the sum means the full amount or the whole. When you break it apart now, it means symmetric perfection. It means one form 
after an accurate rule. It means an exact impression taken from a great copy. Seal us up the sum. You know, when Jesus created Lucifer, he was special. Man, and he was special. He was different. He was unique. In first spirit of prophecy, you may write this reference down. Not in your handout. You know, I only had one page to work with. Mrs. White says this. Satan in heaven, before his rebellion, was a high exalted angel. Next in honor to God's dear son. He was the head elder. He was the vice president. Are you with me? He was the right hand man to the Godhead. Are you with me? He now says his countenance, like those of the other angels, were mild. Express of happiness. Here it is now. But his forehead was high and broad, showing powerful intellect. And you know what we say today? We say the brother has a huge forehead, that brother has some brains. Did you, have you seen Charles Darwin's forehead, man? It's like a bullet, man. No, we, we attach, you ain't got no forehead, you ain't got no knowledge. <laughs> what she says now. His form was perfect. Bearing a noble and majesty. Here is now a special light beamed on his countenance and shone around him brighter and more beautiful than all the other angels. That will seal us up the song. Beloved, that means in the Hebrew, he was skillful in war. He is skillful in administration. You think you can run a company? That means he's skillful in all, underscore, all religious affairs. Who do you think invented Hinduism and Buddhism? and Shintoism, and Rastafarianism, and all these is in schisms, where folks are willing to die for. He has wrapped those packages tight, man. But he's skillful in all science. We are told there are over 600 areas of science one can study, and based on our limitation, we may master one. But there are three signs we are told he takes a keen interest in. It has to do with the mind, y'all. One is phrenology. The other is psychology. And the other is called mesmerism, animal magnetism. Thou sealest up the sun. But even though he is perfect in beauty, full of knowledge, but there, there, is, there are limit, limitations. Restriction, shame placed on him. And I'm going to give you a few. One, number one, Satan cannot read the mind. You ought to say amen for that one. Amen. Because let me, if he could, we would be in trouble. Amen. He doesn't know what you're thinking now. Some of you have planned to make a move for Jesus if he knew that. Even though he understands the mind, there is a chain placed upon him. He cannot read the mind. Why? The apostle Paul says, for it is with the mind I serve God. When I was in school, they taught me, when you preach not, you've got to aim for the head first. Shoot for the head because our message is a thinking man. You can't be a fool and be a Christian. You've got to think this thing out. What we have come to a point now, we're doing a whole lot of shouting. Ain't no thinking. Go to church. What did he say? I don't know, but it was good. <laughs> Meaning it was good to the emotions. Good to the lower passion. The mind. That's why you should discourage any kind of movie. 
that promotes reading the mind. The X man is all about mind. You need to go read their Bibles if you ask me. Men have sought to tap into people's mind, which is witchcraft. And I hope you're not watching these kind of movies. The mind. This is why it says, in the, listen, you ought to get, the, if you have mind problems, you need to get these books. It's called Mind, Character, and Personality. Book one and book two. You need to get these books. If you have, if your mind is not stabilized, you need to get and read them. He says there are many who are really troubled because of the low, the basing thoughts that come into the mind and are not easily banished. You can't shake them. You're in church trying to serve God and a lewd thought just come across you. You got to shake that thing out, man. She says, now here it is now. Satan ha ha has his evil angels around us. Though they cannot read man's thoughts. Hallelujah. But they closely watch the words and actions. So all you got to do is when you're depressed, you just smile. When you're hungry, you just lick those lips. When you're discouraged, you just happy. You throw them off. But what happens now, what's in your mind, you read on your face, bingo, I got you. Can't read the mind and thank God for that one. Because if he could read the mind, we would be in trouble. The lion is chained. Limitation number two is this. Satan cannot force us to sin or commit evil. Cannot. Lion is chained, brothers and sisters. Where do you get that? It's in the Bible. Matthew chapter 4, verse 6, the temptation. And the Bible says this now. And he saith unto him, Jesus, if thou be the Son of God, do what? Now why couldn't he just push him down? I just push him down. <laughs> no, he couldn't push Jesus down. Can't push him down. That's the principle. Where do you find it? Notice she says in the book, Desire of Ages, she magnifies this. The tempter thought to take advantage of Jesus Christ's humanity and urge him to presumption. Here it is now. But while Satan cannot while Satan can solicit, right? He cannot compel. He cannot compel man to sin. He had, he said to Jesus, cast thyself down. Knowing he could not cast him down. For God would interpose to deliver him. Nor could Satan force Jesus to cast himself down. Unless Christ should consent to temptation. He could not be overcome. Then she says, not all the powers of earth or hell can force him in the slightest degree to depart from his father's will. He says, every point in which uh, we fail of meeting the divine standards is an open door by which he can enter to destroy us. He says, the Templar cannot compel us to do evil. He cannot control minds unless they are yielded to his control. The will must consent. Faith let go. It's hold upon Christ before Satan can exercise his power. Nobody can make you do wrong, man. You choose to do wrong. Nobody can force you to sin. It's a choice. Yes, he can set the stage and the atmosphere, but sin is committed by choice. Doesn't matter this morning how strong the temptation is. Like the wild boar may bring you to your knees. You don't have to sin. It doesn't matter how sudden ambush. <laughs> It takes you by surprise. You don't have to sin. Doesn't matter how seductive high heels and fish that stocking. You don't have to sin. 
You not hearing me or you don't want to hear me. You don't have to sin. And by the way, you notice I got these three S's word because they were taken from Joseph in Egypt. She says when Potiphar came and she was a bombshell, y'all. Don't mess around those Egyptian women. They'll put it on. They'll mesmerize you. And she says the temptation was strong. It was sudden. It was seductive. But then she says sin is choice. Mr. Spurgeon said, he said, oh, the prince of evil cannot draft us into their regiment. We cannot be compelled to do Satan's work. The king, the king of this world may make his subjects to serve him, but he cannot raise an enlistment upon the Christian. He goes on to say he may order out his troops to this assignment or to do that dastardly service, but the child of God claims an immunity. All of Satan's command. Sin is a choice. And if you choose sin, brace yourself for its consequence. This thing will take you further than you plan to go and keep you longer than you plan to stay. Amen. Limitation number three is this. Satan cannot create or give life. The lion is chained. Now I could imagine. They, in school, they, they teach us you, got, you have to use your sanctified imagination at times. I remember I played soccer for Parkland or football for Parkland. A traveling team in high school and there was a young man. He came from England. They call him English. Nickname. He was good. He was very, very good. I was a defender. So we were playing a game, and my job was to mark him. And I saw him coming down the flank. And he had a way, he had a move. And when he came, he put it on me. That man shook me so bad. Man. Flat footed. Couldn't regain. And you know, I have to give him props. But it was a good move. And after the game, I said, English, how do you do that? And he said, man, you have to loosen yourself up. And he showed me, and I, I began to practice until I got it. I could imagine in my mind now, I see Jesus creating man. Molding man from the dust of the earth. <laughs> I could imagine saying, Lucifer, Jesus, how do you do that? Show me now. Come on, just seal up the sum. Show me how you did that. And Jesus said, no way, Jose. <laughs> because if I do, trouble and chaos and pandemonium. I could imagine I see Lucifer getting some dirt and trying to do his thing. <laughs> go so some, go so. But no, no movements. Limitation, restriction placed on Lucifer. Amen. Can't create. He just creates chaos. In our homes. And in the church. In the life, in society, chaos. In Exodus chapter 7, we see Lucifer. He's a counterfeit. He's a copycat. You know how it is in Jamaica. Well, you know, most Jamaicans, we're, so we're pirates. We don't write song. We just sit back and wait for somebody to write a song. We just put a little beat to it. Make some money off it. Pirate. <laughs> so Lucifer, he just has to sit back and pervert what God creates. In Exodus, we know how the story goes. The magicians let my people go. And Moses goes down and he throws down his rod. And the Bible says now, then Pharaoh said, that's a light thing, man. He called his wise men and sorcerers. And the magician did the same thing. Bible says the Moses serpent ate up. Now we know if Satan can create, those were not real serpents. He can't even create a cockroach. Can't create. The book Patriarchs and Prophets says this in your handout. 
The magicians did not really cause their rods to become serpent. No. But by magic aided by the great deceiver because he cannot create. They were able to produce a what? Appearance, a hologram. It is beyond Satan's power to chain rods into serpent because he cannot create. She says, the prince of evil, though possessing all the wisdom, and might of a fallen angel has not the power to create or give life. This is to God and God alone. All he did was to create a counterfeit. You see the same principle when in, 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 in 1 Samuel, Samuel was dead, the Bible says. And Saul wanted to go and see Samuel. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel 4, 28, And he said unto her, What form? Not the real thing, because Satan cannot create. He can't bring back life to a dead man, man. And if he, I thank God he can't. We've had enough of Hitler and Stalin and all these Ben Ladenites. Can't create. But thou sealest up the sun. He has some power, y'all. He has the ability to bring your dead person back in a appearance. It's not the real thing. It's an appearance. My grandmother died last year. And I have an uncle. I call him more now than then. He said to me, have you? He's here enough. I said, who? He said, Mama. I said, Uncle Curry, come on. Let me talk to you. He said, no. Came last night. I saw her. And she told me I can have the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> so he moved out of the back room <laughs> into her room and I said well listen do me a favor with a big bible he said it's in the back I'm going to get it and when she comes again you just quote this text please Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 and 6 and I believe the devil heard me because she ain't showed up since story it says he has power not in your handout break on verse 552 to bring before man an appearance of their dead relatives friends the kind of feet is perfect for me to look the words the tones are reproduced with marvelous distinctiveness when they have been led to believe that the dead actually return to communicate with them, Satan causes those to appear who went in the grave unprepared. So if you hold to this concept that the dead can communicate to the living, you're setting yourself up to be deceived. Setting yourself up. But I thank God he can't create. And he can't bring back life because if he could, man, what kind of world would we have? Limitation number four. That's right, Jojo Chaos. Number four, Satan is limited in controlling the elements of nature. He can control them. In Ephesians 2 verse 2, Paul says, man, where in times past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, underscore air. He has the ability to harness oxygen and nitrogen and use them for his power. Where do you find that? It's in the book. 
Great Controversy says this. Satan works through the elements to garner the harvest of unprepared souls. Here it is now. He has studied the secrets of the laboratories of nature. And he uses all his power to control the elements as far as God allows him. He can control him, but this lion is chained. She says now he used, he sweeps away the ripening harvest and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the, the air a deadly taint and thousands perish. These visitations shall become more frequent and destructive from beasts. She says, now even now he's at work in accidents, in calamities, by land and by sea, in great tornadoes and, and a hailstorm, tempest, cyclone. Satan is exercising his power. But he doesn't have ultimate control. But he has some control. Who do you think caused the earthquake in Haiti? Gilbert. Man, I ate sardines for almost bought months. Works through these things. Bring disease and destruction. Mount Carmel, we see it. You know how the story goes. Prophets of Baal. And Elijah, the nonconformist, Ahab and Jezebel were there. And Elijah said, listen, let's just cut to the chase, man. He says, call upon your God. Now call on my God. And who is the Dandada? Let him answer by fire. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and you know how Elijah, Elijah mocked them, man. Today we would say, that's not Christ like to mock them. Elijah mocked them. And the Bible says these men, they cut themselves. Man. They were moaning and groaning. They were whooping and hollering, running around like a chicken head and trying all that stuff. And I could imagine Satan says, shoot, I can do that. I'm the prince of the power of the air, man. I can harness windstorm. And I could imagine I see him raise his hand and begin to charge himself to harness fire because he can. He was chained that day. Look what Ellen White says. She says, gladly would Satan have come to the help of those he was deceiving. All, she says, gladly would we have sent a lightning to kindle the sacrifice. But Jehovah has set him at bounds and restrained his power. Not all the enemy's devices could convey one spark. And if God had not restrained him, he would have burned that thing up. His lion is chain. Thank God for that. Finally, my dear friends, there is a limitation, number five. Satan is limited in regards to destroying the righteous. I thank God for that because I should have been dead, man. Long time ago in a Christless grave. No hope for the resurrection. Somebody prayed for me. Somebody fasted for me. Somebody pleaded for me. And I've got to go and do likewise. I've got to fast for somebody. I've got to pray for somebody. I've got to witness. Job chapter 1. You know how it is. Showdown. Poor Job. An experiment. Lucifer said, you know the reason why he feels because you bless him. God said, no, don't even try that. Lucifer. And the Bible says now, oh, God says, okay, fine. Let's do a test. Go. Put forth thy hand. Touch him, he says. All he has. Only don't put forth your hand upon him. And he couldn't do that. But he could do everything else. And we know how the story goes. Man, that man caused enemies and high cyclones, everything. Wiped Job out. But he could not. And if he could, he would. 
kill his children. But God said, you can't touch Job. Job works for me, man. He's got life insurance. Whoa! <laughs> and health insurance. <laughs> Beloved, this is encouraging to us today. Let me tell you something as we look forward to a new year feeling now Satan may kill, permitted to kill the body, but he cannot touch the soul. And that is why Jesus says, fear him. That can kill both body and soul, but don't fear him that can kill the body. Satan is permitted to take my wealth, but he cannot destroy the power to get wealth. Did Moses say that it is God that giveth you power to get wealth? There are restrictions placed upon Lucifer as to what he can do and cannot do. Satan may be permitted to knock me down, but he is not permitted to knock me out. And that is why the Bible says in Proverbs 24, a just man fall at seven times. I don't care how much time I sin, I'm going to get up, confess, and keep on going. And Gandhi said limping is still walking. He wants you to become so, uh, the guilt of sin, you don't want to pray and you don't want to study. But Jesus says, if you confess, I am willing to forgive you. Doesn't have all power. He may be mighty, but God is almighty. He may be powerful, but Jesus is all powerful. The lion is chained. Satan may be permitted to wreck my marriage. Let me tell you something. He's not permitted to wreck my happiness. Can't take away my joy. The song says, are we joy? Them one destroy. Are we joy? Can't take my joy. Can't destroy my happiness. I was talking to a woman and she was in an abusive relationship. Husband was battering and bruised her. And she said, you know, I've come to my mind. He may have that marriage, but he's not going to stop me from praising God. And she said it is better to dwell. And the Bible says it is better to dwell on the rooftop than to dwell in the house with a cantankerous woman. And she took off, praising God, happy in Jesus. Can't wreck my joy. Can't wreck my joy. Satan may be permitted to destroy the leaves, but he cannot destroy the root. Only God alone can destroy both root and branch. And that is why Joel says God will restore the years that the conquer worm and the plow worm has eaten. There are limitations. Oh, Mr. Spurgeon, it's not in your handout. I couldn't fit it. Just jot it down. Mr. Spurgeon says, in the midst of malaria and pestilence, we are safe with God. Because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, your habitation. There shall no evil befall you, neither shall the plague come near your dwelling. He says, beneath the shadow of Jehovah's wings, we need not be afraid for the terror by night, or the arrows that fly by day, nor the pestilence that walketh at noonday. He says, be ye therefore quiet in the day of evil. Rest peacefully in the day of destruction. All things are ordained by wisdom and precious in the sight of the Lord or the death of his saints. He says, no forces in the world are outside his control. God suffers no foe to trespass on the domain of providence. All things are ordained of God. Especially are our deaths under his peculiar oversight of our exalted Lord. He who was dead and bears the keys of death at his belt, he will guide us through death's iron gate. Surely what the Lord wills and what he wills himself works cannot be otherwise acceptable to his chosen. Let us rejoice. Life and death were in the Lord's hand. That poet was truly inspired. Though plagues and death around me fly, till Jesus bids, I cannot die. 
Not an arrow can hit. Till the God of love permits. We are immortal until our work is done. So what then? So my brother, I spoke to him the other day. When we were closing, he said, blood forward. That's the only way to go is forward. Because the lions are chained, you've got to go forward. Question number eight now says, what military command has Paul given to sincere believers? A military charge for 2016. A military charge. He says, let us go forth. Hallelujah. Let us go forth unto him. It is to Jesus we are to go. Not to church or denominationalism. Love Jesus first and his truth second. Truth apart from Jesus ain't going to save you, man. Unto him, to Christ you are to go. Outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Let us, therefore, set in your mind to go forth, to go forward, not halting or going back. The only path we can take, my dear friends, is the middle path. In that right? That's the only safest ground in this great controversy. As I close, what directive has always been given to pilgrims and their plight? Bible says, I give you several texts, Proverbs 4.27, the Bible says, turn not to the right hand, that's Phariseeism. Or to the left hand, that's loose liberalism. Don't go to the left or the right because you're going to end up in the hot spot. The only way to go is forward. <laughs> Avoid all extremes. And you can go fur in every doctrine. Every doctrine, the devil wants to push us to extremes. You can go to extremes in keeping the Sabbath. You don't even smile. I don't want to desecrate the holy day. You ought to rejoice to the Lord and say amen. amen. But the other extreme is to go shopping in restaurants. I was at a church one Sabbath, just finished preaching, man. High day. And the man said to me, the head elder said to me, we're going to take you to lunch. Now I'm thinking it's to his home. The man said, honey, you got the wallet? We can go to Piccadilly. I said, pick who? <laughs> you ain't taking me no Piccadilly. On this, you crazy man. Haven't you read what Moses? That's an extreme. Deuteronomy 5:32, Moses says, You shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God hath commanded you. Turn not aside with the right hand. Take the middle ground. He says in Deuteronomy 28, 14, Thou shalt not go from any of my words which I command thee. To the right hand or to the left hand, I, believe, I beseech you, my dear friends, avoid all extremes. Avoid all extremes. Take the middle path. One Puritanic author wrote, we must sometimes walk on a razor edge of fear and straightforward. That is the only way left for us now. Keep your mind, your heart, your eyes, and your feet in the middle path. And you shall have come past the beautiful house before you know it not. Only the middle ground are saved. Only the middle path will be saved. My dear friends, good news, the lions are chained. The lions are chained. The devil does not have full sway over us. The lions are chained. I want you to listen this morning to this song as Sister Donna sings. And let the words sink in your mind as we bring this service to its close. Can I get this mic, please? Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, help me stand. 
In a few hours, we're going to be having a baptism. I want to have a special prayer today for all those candidates who have made up your mind to go forward with Jesus. I'm going to ask you to just slip from your seat, please, and face the congregation. Be brave, be bold for Jesus this morning. Praise God, they're coming now. Praise God, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. You know, I remember my mother had left and went to America in the early 80s, and she decided to send for, send for me and my brother. And they sent for us, and they, they said I was too bad, so they sent me back. I was just misunderstood, y'all. 
And I was placed in boarding school, boarding home. Everything was nice until the lady of the home moved to America. And I was under the supervision of the husband. A man smoked ganja morning, noon, and night. And he would send me to go buy some herbs sometime. And I would go no better. But through it all, I got enrolled in Kingsway Adventist School. And I liked Kingsway because on Friday, school let out half day. And I could take my lunch money to go buy candy. Finally, sitting in school and class, I, I believe that this is it. And I made up my mind I wanted to get baptized. But the lion stood in my way. When I told the man of the house, I said, I want to get baptized. He said, if you get baptized, I'm going to beat you. Now, my mother was paying good money, American money, <laughs> for the supervision. And I said, well, you know, it's amazing that you would send me to go buy ganja all the time. And, oh, no problem. I want to serve Jesus a problem now. I snuck, got baptized, and found out. And I came from church the evening, never forget it, it was a Saturday night. And he was laying wait for me. I mean, if I tell you, I get baptized, boy. And back in those days, we had those keys. Those, I think it was some English keys, man. Long and steel. And he took it. And he hit me in my head right here. And the blood just flowed down. This thing right here is permanent until Jesus comes. I bear in my body these marks that I love Jesus, man. You wasn't going to deter me from serving Jesus. Though he may roar, that line was changed. You know, a couple years ago, I, I was in Oakwood, man. I just woke up one night and I just felt to pray for the man. Did me evil. I said, Lord, I don't know why, but I'm, I'm praying for Mr. Richards. He's a wicked man to me. I, mean, I was so wicked, man. When he found I got baptized, they would cook soup every Sabbath. Saturday, and he would cook pigtail soup. I was so hungry, man, I would take out the pork and just eat the dumpling. <laughs> hungry! Did <laughs> no better until the church heard what was happening and they said, Come home with us. Never ate no more pigtail soup again. And you know, I pray for that man. Pray for that man. And the other day, I met his son on Facebook. not what are you doing man God is good man he said boy what? we couldn't find you man what, what happened to you he said man you know when you used to get abused man I, I wanted to help you man I said man I, said, I didn't want to talk about it man because it just it hurt man traumatized I said I have no hard feelings towards a man man that was Satan's last effort to deter me from making my way to the beautiful house. But bless God, look where I now stand. I don't stand where I am because I am what I am. But because the great I am has made me what I am. And it is no secret what God can do what he did for me. He can do for you. Do you love him this morning? Do you love Jesus this morning? He says, arise somebody, be baptized, wash away your sins this morning. Call on the name of Jesus. Somebody here this morning needs to come forward. I won't be labeled this appeal, man. This year is almost finished. Some have made no move to the kingdom. And you think the new year going to make anybody new think again, man. It makes nobody new. 
Your resolutions are like ropes of sand. You know how much promises will be made this year and come January broken. How many treadmills going to be purchased, going to lose weight? You'll, they'll start the first two weeks and go back to eating Dunkin' Donuts and French fries. Because resolutions without Jesus are like ropes of sand. But you can begin the year with Jesus. I wouldn't want this appeal to close and there's somebody here. You've been coming to church for months. What hinderest thou? Just come, man. Just slip from your seat. When that soul is reconverted, Mrs. White says, let that soul be rebaptized. Is there one more for Jesus this morning? Just come, man. Come. There's a backslider here. Come, my young man. Come. There's a backslider here, man. You're going to let the ear close off. And I'll make your move for Jesus, man. Tomorrow ain't promised to nobody. We're about appearances. God's going to fix it. Fix me. He'll fix you. All he wants is the heart. Worry about appearances. That's the least of God's problem. There'll be a lot of people in hell who dress right. There's going to be some folks who juice morning, wheat grass, Brussels sprout, and thinking toe juice every morning. They're going to bust hell fire wide open. You know why? Because their heart not right. You get the heart right, God will fix everything. Come just as you are. There's one more. I don't, listen, time is far spent. I'm only going to give two more minutes. Somebody need to come this morning. If you want me to come, I'll come get you. Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. The preacher will come get you this morning. Just come, my brother. Come, my sister. Just come. Come, young man. Come, man. You're right. Come. Child shall lead them. Come in the church for years now. Come. Just come. Hey, I tell people, man, you may laugh at me. I was rebaptized three times, elder. At these shoes, man. He again? I'm trying to go to heaven. Didn't know no other way. God saw my heart. Trying to make it to heaven, Jesus. I need help. Somebody else. Just come, come, come. You've been coming to church for years. Hey, you've heard enough. You've seen enough. You've read enough. This is your Sabbath. Oh, yes. Somebody else. There's a backslider here, man. Yes, Jesus. Working on the Sabbath. Huh? You're going to treat God like that, man? Look how good God has been to you, man. You're going to desecrate his holy day for what? For minimum wage? <laughs> Some retirement you ain't going to use? Some 401k that's going to be frozen? You, you, you see, sin affects the mind. You, you can't think straight. Calling somebody here this morning, man. I'm hungry for souls this morning. Bar our heads, please. Oh, Jesus, I done done what you told me to do. God, they should die and be lost. It's nobody's fault but their own. Can't blame the preacher. You can't lay no charge on my account. Ella Bean, come, pray for us, please. Please, Ella, please, please, pray for these candidates. Please, please get the mic. Somebody is still coming, you know. Just come, just come. All eyes are closed. Just come, come. Renew your walk with Jesus. Come, come just as you are. The Spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that is thirsty say, come. Come just as you are. Ella, pray for them and pray for me. That I'll be saved in God's kingdom. Holy Father God, we are walking on water. We do not know where our next footstep will take us. And like Peter, Lord God, we raise up our hands and in a desperate cry we ask, Lord God, save us. Yes, Lord. Save us, Lord God. It is one thing that is certain that Peter knew that God would not fail him when he called. And so, Lord God, we 
try to walk on water. We try to do things on our own. We fight the battle of life and we are beaten back by the arch deceiver. But at the appropriate moment, Lord God, the Spirit of God reminds us that there is Jesus waiting. And we cry out, Lord God, save us. Yes, Lord. And for every beleaguered soul who stepped through these doors this morning, you know what the Spirit told you this morning. Jesus said of Nathan, there goes a true Israelite, for I saw him sitting under the fig tree. Hallelujah. The Lord saw you coming. He brought you here. Even now you're fighting with his spirit, but he saw you, a true Israelite, sitting under the fig tree, waiting on your destiny. Your destiny is with Christ. Even now, come now. Rededicate your mind and hearts to God. And for those who were brave enough to come, Lord God, we offer you the perfect offering. It is not a beautiful service. It is a church caught up in the service of God and that would bring souls to the doors of the kingdom of God. Bless our efforts, Lord God. We have issues, we have faults. We ask now, Lord God, as we crest the end of the old year and we look over and about, over into Canaan land at the new year, that you would take these dear souls and that you would hold them in the palm of your hand. We remember that powerful prayer in John chapter 17. We still believe that God's word has not lost its power. And you prayed, Lord God, and you said, Holy Father, those that you have given to me, hold them in your hand, that nothing would take them from you. And so, Lord God, I pray this prayer this morning. I pray in faith. I pray that each person that is standing here and even the one that is sitting there would still come and that Jesus is still able to keep them from falling. Send your holy angels who will be their companions, not by might nor by power, but by my Holy Spirit. Be their companion, Lord God. Be with them. Bless them. Thank you for a dear pastor. He's hungry for the souls of men and women and children. And we thank you for him. Help us to follow. Thank you for his leading. And most of all, thank you, under shepherd, the chief shepherd. Lead us on and we will follow. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.